It's my pleasure to uh, introduce our presenters this afternoon. We have Natalie from the United Kingdom, who has, uh, well, where do I start? Natalie is a, is a world famous channeler, and uh, she's going to be doing some amazing channeling work this afternoon. And uh, we're going to welcome Natalie in a moment. Uh, AJ is, is the presenter for this afternoon, and he travels around the world. I've been interested in uh, spirituality and personal development for uh, more than 20 years, and I've found that the information that AJ is going to share with you this afternoon is some of the most profound and empowering information that I think you'll ever come across in your entire life. So let's give uh, Natalie and uh, AJ a very warm and enthusiastic Sunshine Coast welcome. Natalie, by the way, is sitting right up the back there, if you can't identify Natalie. So, and Natalie will be, the, we're breaking the, the session that we're doing today into two. The first part of the session would be you putting up with me for a while, while we have a discussion about the secrets of the universe. And the next part of the session, we will actually be able to ask some spirits about the things that I've taught you today. So you will actually be able to ask questions of some spirits who have experienced some of the things that I will be, t be talking about, and you will have the ability to question them and work through some of your own questions that have arisen from our discussion. Does that sound alright? That's, that's what we'll be doing. <coughs> so my name firstly is Alan John Miller, and that's why people call me AJ, it's a bit uh, shorter than Alan John. So, uh, and please call me AJ whenever you're referring to me, that's fine. Or just you or anything like that, that's fine. Before I start though, I would like to talk about something uh, that's really important for the rest of our discussion. And that is, I want to, you to be able to be open to some of the material that I'm going to present. Now when I say open, I don't mean that you're not going to have some doubts, because I can assure you, you're going to have many doubts about some of the material I present today. But, that you're at least open enough to have a questioning heart. And so what I'd like to do is just describe a little bit at the start, as to how you are made, in terms of how your emotions are processed. So, most of you would know that you have a material body, that you can touch, obviously. Do you all know too that you've got a spirit body? A spirit body? And your spirit body is actually, right at the moment, very similar looking to your material body. And from a spirit's perspective, they see your, your spirit body firstly, before they see your material body. And you can interact with your spirit body and all of you do interact with your spirit body when you're in your sleep state. Right? But the part I would like to refer to is the part that's behind both of those two things. The soul. What do you think the soul is? Someone said the mind. Can I just address that first? The soul is not your mind. The mind actually belongs to the spirit body. It's energy. Your soul is energy? Soul is energy. Well, actually your material body is energy too. Yeah. And your spirit body is energy too. Yeah. So energy doesn't really separate your soul from those two other bodies, does it? They're all made up of energy of some kind. That makes sense, doesn't it? Isn't your material body energy? Yes. Okay. So what is your soul? Let's go back. Uh, a part of something else is what you're basically suggesting. Yeah. We'll go through that as to what the soul is in more detail uh, in terms of its physical construction. 
<laughs> but it's, it's actually not a part of the divine energy unless certain things occur. And we'll talk about that. So then, is it like an expression of the highest self or the higher? A lot of people refer to it as the higher self. Right? I'm just wondering if these labels that we throw around. But how does the murderer refer to it? A murderer. How does a murderer refer to their soul? Like, I don't know if their soul would be their higher self. The soul can actually have low or base emotions in it as well. So we'll talk about that too in a second. So what is the soul? Any ideas? Emotions? It's your emotions. It's a container for your emotions, your passions, your intentions. Now we you got the idea? What other things do you think would be in it? Your memories. Your memories. <coughs> Motives. Motives or yeah, intentions or desires. We let's call them desires instead of motives too. But motives is fine too. Conscience. Uh, conscience, yes, uh, there is a conscience in the soul, certainly. Um, well, the mind, remember, is separate. We'll talk about this later. Um, the mind belongs to the spirit form just like your brain belongs to your material form. Obviously, when you pass, you still remember everything about your life. So therefore, your material body's brain doesn't store all of your memories about your life. Because if it did, all those memories would be gone, wouldn't they? As soon as you pass, the, the body disintegrates into nothing, doesn't it? whether you put it in a fire or you bury it, it still disintegrates into nothing. So therefore, the brain does not store your emotions and it does not store your memories and it does not have all of these things. You follow me? Is it the cellular memory? Uh, well, the cellular memory, we often refer to cellular memory, but again, that refers to the body. So that wouldn't be that either. <laughs> okay. okay? So what I'm going to do now is just rub out those two bodies because, firstly, I want to say that this is the real you. So it's not what you think, it's what you feel that makes you the real you. And of course, personality and all that is involved in the soul as well. Now, by the way, that is only if we're talking about just yourself that's only a half of a soul actually you are in fact one half of a complete soul and we'll talk about why that's the case but before we do I want to redraw this little diagram put the soul in the middle here remember your soul is your Emotions, intentions, okay. So we got the soul. There's two primary influences on the soul. Any idea what they might be? I'll give you an, I'll give you an idea. One of them is So what would the other one be? Uh, I don't know. I'd say truth is light myself. <laughs> you think about it. Um, love. Everything that's disharmonious with love, we would classify as an error, shall we? If we do that for the purpose of our discussion today. So anything that's disharmonious, disharmony, harmony, with love is error and anything that is harmonious with love so harmony with love is truth so truth is always harmonious with love error is always disharmonious with love in the Bible they call this 
a dirty word, sin. Right? But we may call it sin because that has a tendency to be a bit messy. All right. So right at the moment, there are two primary influences occurring on your soul, on your feelings, on your emotions, on your passions, on your desires, on your intentions, on your aspirations. And those two primary emotions are harmony. Well, there's a group of them that are in harmony with love. And there's also a group of them right at the same time, inside the same soul, that are disharmonious with love. So let me identify some of them for you. What do you feel anger would be? So anger would be disharmony with love? Okay, so let's put sort of anger there. Uh, what would uh, compassion be? Harmony with love? So that would be one of those there. What would be doubt? Doubt would be because of, usually we have doubts which are caused by fears. So let's say then fear would be one of those that are in disharmony with love, wouldn't they? Uh, what happens when we have a real strong conviction inside of ourselves, like feeling really positively motivated? That's harmonious with love? Okay, so being positive. Alright. Well, I'm going to do, uh, in, during this discussion, I'm going to talk about many things that are going to raise your fear and your anger and your doubts. And what I want you to do is to remember that they come from within you. What I'm saying isn't causing them. <laughs> Follow me? You reckon you can do that for me? <laughs> what I'm saying is not causing your doubts or your fears or your anger. The anger or doubts or fears come from within you. Would you agree with that? They are your emotions, they are your emotional response to whatever I'm saying. You, and often we make what are called a assumptions. We assume that what somebody is saying to us is a certain thing. And the reason why we make these assumptions is because inside of us emotionally it's like we're wearing a certain type of glasses, if you like, on our eyes. So everything that we see, we see through the eyes of our emotions. So if I'm an angry man, and my whole life, what will I do with everything I see? I will translate it, won't I, through my anger. And you see that happening a lot, right? Where you have an angry person, and they're always getting angry with all sorts of situations. And sometimes you're thinking, why do they get angry there for it? Seem to be pretty innocent to me, right? So it's the meaning you put on it. It's the meaning you put on it, often, yes. And these kind of emotions come from a disharmony with love, and they are errors, but there is a problem with all errors, and that is they are inside of us emotionally. And when something gets inside of us emotionally, we believe it is the truth. So the man who's angry believes he's justified getting angry with everyone, doesn't he? Because he believes his anger is the truth. Everyone's doing stuff to me and I don't like it. That's what he <coughs> believes to be truth. But is it the truth? Well, it's not harmonious with love. So it's not the truth. The truth is quite different. The truth is that he is choosing to retain these emotions from some very, very deep causes within himself. Does that make sense? Now, I'll talk more about that later, but I wanted to open with that for a good reason. And that is that today I'm going to trigger lots of these kind of emotions in you. And you're going to feel like that <coughs> bastard AJ. <laughs> and a lot of people feel very much like walking out the door. And you will probably feel like walking out the door with the next set of things I'm going to say to you, actually. And I wanted to warn you in advance so that you knew that these kind of feelings are related to disharmony with love. Yeah. 
Now, when you don't take responsibility for your own emotion, you will project it to somebody else. So in a minute, when I start talking about some things that will challenge you, one of your temptations is going to be to say, oh, that idiot, AJ, I don't even know why I'm here really, right? And you will go down this trap of trying to feel like it was my fault that these emotions come up inside of you. And I'm warning you in advance. All right? Is there any questions about that? So everyone's okay with the soul being those, the real part of yourself being that? Sorry, I just I do have a question. You, you talked uh, very briefly about sin on the right hand side, and you, you said that kind of was a little bit misleading. Or can you just explain that a little bit more? Yeah, and um, all sin in is is disharmony with love. So when we use the term sin in the connotation that is religious today, often people feel there's punishment required when we're in disharmony with love. So they use the term sin and punishment together. And rather than do that, all, I, all, I, all sin is, it comes from a Greek word that means missing the mark. So if you can imagine someone shooting an arrow onto a target and they've missed the bullseye, well, they've sinned. But isn't that equation there that you put up very similar to one side is you know, it's good and the other side is evil? One of the the truth is if we look at the world today, there is certainly evil in the world, is there not? Yeah. As I can see, yes. Like, is the murderer evil? Well, who am I to judge? Well, I'm saying did he do an evil deed? Yes. I don't know. You don't know? Well, when he passes in the spirit world, you'll certainly know. And we'll talk about that as well. All, emo all so-called evil comes from emotion in the end anyway. It all comes from these emotions. So in the end, the emotions that are disharmonious with love are darkness. And anything that is, is out of darkness is just going to create more darkness or more error, more disharmony with love. But certainly... There is truth and error, and if you look at the world, in a, you can look at the world very philosophically if you desire, and say that there's no such thing as bad or good, but how many of you feel that in your own lives? Really? Honestly? Now, quite, I would say the majority of you don't feel that in your own lives. There's times in your own life where you feel that it's actually, there's something happened to you that wasn't good, and there's things that happen to you that are good. Is that how you feel? So even though we might philosophize ourselves away from the fact of things being harmonious with love or not harmonious with love, in the end, the truth is that there is this duality, if you could, like going on. But it's just a choice. We'll talk about that too. Is that okay for the moment? Yeah. Yep. All right. All right. Someone said to me that as soon as you see that smile that I just gave you, <laughs> the, next, the next thing that comes is going to be challenging. <laughs> right, so the first thing that I'm going to say is truth, truth is essential in every transaction. Do you agree? You think of all the, tr the transactions you've had with people. How many times have you been hurt, if we can use that term, from a time when they were dishonest with you? say in a business dealing or in a husband and wife type situation, a partnership, when they're dishonest there is a feeling of a feeling that arises within, isn't it? Alright, so the first thing I like to do is be truthful with you. And so I want to talk to you about how I know all the things that I'm going to tell you in this session. And how I know is that I've experienced all of these things that I'm going to talk about with you. And I remember them as well. So you'll be able to ask questions as much as you wish, and I'll answer them to the best of my ability about anything that you desire. Now, if I don't want to answer a question, there'll often be a reason why behind it, and I'll tell you, and I'll be honest with you. So the first thing I'm going to tell you is that uh, the person I am is actually a person who lived on Earth in the first century. And my name is Jesus. And I'm serious. 
Oh, there's lots of projection from imagine. <laughs> so, what's the feelings that arise? I'm married. You're married? Yeah. <laughs> you must be. I'm just being honest, that's yeah. what, I don't know whether it was my mind or my soul, but I think you can call yourself Jesus, then I can call myself Mary. Okay, but what if I am Jesus? See, there's three possibilities, isn't there? One possibility is that I think I'm Jesus and I'm a nutcase. <laughs> That's a possibility, isn't it? That's the one mostly in all of your minds, right? <laughs> the next possibility is that I think that I'm Jesus and I'm deceitful. That's not so good, huh? And then the third possibility is I am Jesus. And that's the choice that you're going to have to make at some time in our discussion, perhaps. But in the end, I'm telling you that the reason why I can say what's coming, the next set of things I want to talk to you about, is because I've experienced them, and I am that person. Oh, it's, it's just feel the feelings. <laughs> Honestly. I'm saying the second. Well, lots of people say that with Cleopatra. And I agree. There's actually about probably a, 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 probably a million or so people who think they're Jesus, right? And most of them are in asylums. <laughs> I agree with that too. But one of us has to be. Oh, there are literally heaps of people named Jesus. In fact, right now in, in, in Brazil, there are literally hundreds of thousands of people named Jesus. So, uh, so yes, but I'm talking about, I am Yeshua ben Joseph, the son of <coughs> Joseph and Mary in the first century. So you're saying you are the vibration of that? No, I am the person. I'm not saying I'm the vibration of the person. I'm saying I am the soul of Jesus. I'm a half of a soul, by the way. So, how do you know you are? How do I know I am? You might be like all those other things. <laughs> because I remember everything about my life. <laughs> so do I speak Aramaic? Like, it can be spoken. Can you speak? Not now, I can't, no. Because you don't remember everything about that life or that language? No, what happens is that as you work through your emotional state, and this is something we will talk about, you, may, you have memories come back as you work through your emotions. So, uh, for example, if you think about your life, how many of you have had some kind of abusive childhood? Is there, I, I know it's a sensitive subject. Um, many of you who have had an abusive childhood would realise that you don't have the memories of that abuse until you're actually prepared to emotionally experience the memory. Does that make sense? And this is the same with every... There are actually 14 people who have returned from... from heaven, if you could call it that, and we'll talk about where it is actually from, and every one of those is going through a process of recovery of memories using that technique. Isn't language quite common that to... The majority of my life I never spoke a language. So you're, you're thinking that the majority of my life happened in the first century. The majority of life, my life's happened from the first century till now. And all of that time I was in the spirit world, I didn't speak a language. Did you remember the memories under your own three bodies? Yes. So you, you haven't had other past lives no. to this one? So you've gone from Jesus to this one? Yes. Okay. 
It was? <laughs> yeah. I'm talking about why too. <laughs> Sorry? Because I have, have all the memories of my life. How do you know you are, what's your name? Jill. Jill? How do you know you're Jill? My mother and father told you. Okay. <laughs> my mother and father told me I was you. So yeah. And I have all the memories of that, that, that life. Not, not them all, of course, because just like you can't remember all of your life right now, obviously there are certain emotions tied up with the experience of all of the memories. Yeah. No, the Bible is not an accurate account of my life. Um, there are some things that occurred in the Bible that are accurate as to what happened in my life. As I have memories myself of my past, I can actually hear that. Yes. Yeah. Um, yeah. Now, I had to say that because the next set of things that I'm going to talk about are things that I've experienced. And I want primarily, like, it does not matter to me who you believe I am. What, but what I would like to do in particular is help you connect with God. Now, how many of you have a problem with the term God? Yeah. <laughs> One. I don't like saying it's G-O-D. Okay. Yeah, I don't know why. I just, it's only because it's tied into religious churches who are full of control and fear. Exactly. exactly. And the majority of people who don't like the term God feel the same. But I'm going to use the term as the source of your being. Right, so if anyone has questions, if they could sort of speak fairly loudly, that would be good. Very loudly. Or if uh, they even stand up, maybe, I'd probably... Um, just relating my own perception, I perceive... Big voice. Um, yeah, I perceive God as the Right, so how many people believe God is a process or just an energy of the universe? Yeah? How many believe God is an entity? A being? Every time we start talking about energy, every time we start talking about energy, we start getting very philosophical. I don't want to do that with you today. What I want to do is show you how to connect with God, and I know for certain that God is not just an energy. God is a being that has energy. So it's a bit like, um, here's, let, let me draw God like that. God has a number of attributes and qualities. So attributes and qualities. What's one of those qualities? Love. Can you see, though, that God has, must have other qualities? For, for instance, you look at uh, the design in creation. What do you see in creation? Perfection. Like, not only perfection, but huge amounts of mathematics, isn't it? Yes. Okay, so, so God must be a mathematician too, right? <laughs> And God must be a comedian too, right? So, so God has more qualities than just love. Now, love, when I say just love, love is an awesome quality. And in fact, the most powerful quality in the universe. But it is one of God's attributes. So what I would like to do is rather than focus on these qualities... Focus on the person or the being behind the qualities. Do you know what I mean by that? It's a bit like in our interaction. Rather than focusing on the emotions I'm receiving from the interaction, so I say, uh, might say, well, yeah, Peter, instead of viewing Peter as Peter, I'll just view Peter as a bit of energy that I can see in his aura and, and everything that I can see, and I'll, I'll interrelate, interrelate with Peter like he's just that energy. Now, what does that do to my relationship with Peter? It changes it into a depersonalized relationship, does it not? Right? 
And what I'm wanting to do is to have a personal relationship with this entity that's behind these energies. Does that make sense to you? Okay. So, one of the primary attributes of God is the masculine and feminine energies that come from God. So, God is our mother as well as our father. And I refer to God as my mother, or mummy, or daddy. In the first century, I used to say daddy. So God has masculine and feminine energies coming from her. But there are two other main qualities that I'd like to focus on. One is divine love. And the other is divine truth. Now, divine truth, I would call it, what I say it is, is absolute. In other words, what I'm going to present to you is that God is the only being in the universe. And when I say in the universe, I'm using it very loosely because God is outside of the universe. Because God created the universe. Right? God is the only being that has absolute truth. And every single thing that I say to you today, and every single thing anybody ever says to you, is going to be relative to that truth. In other words, it's never going to be the full truth. It's going to be partial truth. Even though I've lived for a certain amount of time, I still don't know all the secrets of God. <coughs> and there are many beings in the spirit world who have lived longer than I and still do not know the secrets of God. And you can, you today will actually have an opportunity to talk to some of these spirits who are living in different places, in different dimensions of the universe, and they do not know all of the secrets of God. So you're saying the expression of the divine truth and the divine love they do know a large portion of it and but when I say a large portion if we use the term infinite which can only refer to God as one of God's qualities then what's a proportion of infinite in the end it ends up to be a smidgen doesn't it a tiny little piece of the entire whole so no matter how much we ever come to know there will always be more to know. That's what infinite means, doesn't it? So God is infinite. That is one of the qualities of God. One of the attributes of God. Which also means that God's truths are infinite when you think about it, doesn't it? Right. Now there is a way, a very, very fast way where you can come to understand the truths of God. And I'm not talking about your truth here. I'm not talking about what you believe to be true, because you're going to have to give up a lot of your beliefs if you want to actually accept God's truth. You see, on the earth today, what the problem is, is that man defines God. And if you have an intellectual attempt to divine God, you are always going to miss the mark. Are you not? Because how can you define something that you've never connected with? Right? What we want to do in our future, and this is what I'm going to propose to you, is that you let God define God to you. In other words, we're going to suggest to connect to God in some manner, and that connection, and we'll talk about how to connect with God, 
that connection will, from that point on, define truth and define the truth about God to you. You will discover the truths of the universe the most fastest, the fastest possible way doing using this method. When you think about it, if we don't use this method, the only other methods we've got available to us to, us to investigate truth is to actually experiment like a scientist, right? So what we would have to do is we would have to go along and investigate one truth. Oh no, after 50 years of investigation, no, that doesn't work out. There's a few errors with that, so I modify that a bit and tweak it a bit. And that, that's my truth for a while. And isn't that the way science discovers the universe? With this constant modification, experimentation, modification, experimentation, and so forth. And I'm suggesting to you that that doesn't need to occur. There is actually a way for you to connect with God and discover truth far more rapidly. So are you saying that if we let go of our definitions of God and, of, and uh, we're actually living by definitions, definitions of ourselves, and yep. that's how we make sense of our world. Yeah, yeah. And we, the problem with us today is we're trying to make sense of our world intellectually. Yeah. And what I'm suggesting is that it's impossible to connect to God and connect to your own soul, which is emotions, unless you start making definitions or allowing things to come to you emotionally. Well, we your attachment to your definitions. Yes, that, that is necessary. Yep. All right, so let's have a look at the secrets of what God has done for you as a general summary, as far as I'm aware of them at this point. The first thing God did, as soon as she has an intention, everything happens instantaneously. Even if she, if she has an intention to answer your longing to her, you will be answered instant, instantaneously. Now, I see most of you saying, well, you know, I prayed about some things last week and they still haven't happened. <laughs> right. So what's going on? Does God have the power to answer you instantaneously? Would you, what do you feel about that? Yes. yes. Okay. So therefore God certainly can answer you instantaneously. So God must have answered you instantaneously. God does what God can do straight away. Why delay it? The only problem is that we're not sensitive to the answers. And it may not be in the form that we thought it was. It's rarely in the form that we think we're going to receive it. Yes, rarely. The reason why is because we live in a state of error and truth. Like, there's a mixture of error and truth within our souls. Would you agree? Sometimes you get angry, don't you? Sometimes you're sad, aren't you? Well, if you are, do you think God gets angry? No. No. Why, why would God get angry? There's nothing to get angry about. Everything God created is perfect. Does God get sad? No. Well, if God got sad, it'd be raining here all the time, I reckon. <laughs> like, honestly, if God had those emotions, there would be major problems in the universe. God does not experience those emotions. And I'm going to suggest to you as well that there'll be a time when you won't feel those emotions either. You don't need to. But there's a process to go through first. So the first intention she had was to have children. One of the first primary intentions was to have children. And she created children in her image. In other words, she created them with masculine and feminine qualities. So we have these souls, which you could say are little images or children of God. of which you and I are one, half of one. And that soul in that state only knows a few things. Let's look at what it knows. Firstly, it's yet to experience life. So it does not have any experience at the instant. I'm talking about the instant of your creation. Do you remember the instant of your creation as a soul? I don't either. Right? Because the truth is that none of us remember it because we're not, we weren't conscious of our existence at that point. Does that make sense? So they are, they have no consciousness at that point. 
comes in your service-ness at that point. At that point, they also are not, they're not self-aware. <laughs> Sorry? Well, they're not self-aware yet because they've just been created, but they don't know they've been created. Mm -hmm. yeah. Alright? So they're not self-aware. And by the way, that also means that they don't know how to make decisions at the point either, doesn't it? How can you make decisions if you're not self-aware? All decision-making comes about from being self-aware. So if that's the case, you could say they don't really have any... There's no free will at that point. Now that's challenging, hey? How many have been told that there's free will at every point? Yeah. There's no free will. Think about it. How can you know you've got free will when you don't know yourself and you're not self-aware? Does that make sense? So it's very, very hard to have free will and be able to exercise that free will. So what these souls living in a location of the universe need to do, and this is part of the process God created, was they need to do a thing called incarnate. Not the one you're thinking of, no. The one you're thinking of is to do with soul attractions or the law based on the law of attraction. Yeah, and no, they, they are not. A, they are all uh, living in a certain place of the universe where one day you will see them, actually, if you progress to a certain point, you will actually see these souls and what's happening to them. Have you seen them? Yeah. What do they look like? Um, if you can picture... Uh, it's very hard to describe most things in human terms, right? But if you can picture a ball with sort of a, almost like a chink down the middle of the ball, but with this huge amounts of energy flying off this ball, but also energy working its way between each half as well. That is the soul in terms of how you see it. Yeah. It's not how you experience it. It's quite different. How you're experiencing it is right now how you're experiencing your soul. But how you see it when you're looking at one, is, is how, that's how you can see it. You see that only when you get to the 22nd sphere of the spirit world, the 22nd dimension. I'm talking about that. Mm -hmm. Alright, so they're going to go through this process of incarnation. What happens is the soul splits into two. Not at the same time. When I say, it, obviously the split occurs at the same time, but the incarnation process is Mum and Dad have sex, create bodies. There's two bodies created at the time of conception. One body is the spirit body. And the other body is the material body. And if it's a female half of the soul, then obviously the bodies will be How many of you feel you were a male in your last lifetime? I mean, if you're female now. Yeah? Where you're being heavily influenced by a male spirit. Because it's actually impossible for you to change the sex of your half of your soul. And the sex of its attraction. Is that why you get some males who are very feminine? Um, the split of the soul is very, it's like, have you seen the a standard distribution graph where you have, I don't know if you know much about mathematics, nobody liked mathematics when they were in school. <laughs> no? okay. The laws of statistics basically state that it, there's a 90 percentile range of anything. So if we, took, if we look at a, at a scale, which is the degree of masculinity versus the degree of femininity, and I'm talking about the complete soul here, not the soul half. The complete souls are obviously can be very masculine, can be any range in between. Does that make sense? The complete soul. Now if it's in this range here, the soul separates into two halves that are attracted to feminine bodies only. 
they still have masculine and feminine qualities, but the bodies that they're attracted to when they're split are going to both be feminine. On this side, they'll both be masculine. In between, there's going to be a large variety. So some males will have a lot of femininity, some females will have a lot of masculinity. Yeah. But the body you're attracted to will be the same every incarnation. Right. We talk a lot about reincarnation because there's a lot of things I'm going to say about reincarnation that are going to severely challenge you. Right. Okay. Yeah. It's when you actually do um, into a, into that into a male or female body. Yep. It, is it going to be exactly the same, or you've got to have new experiences? Um. A lot of people feel that there is this process of having to have new experiences. The soul needs to reincarnate to have new experiences. And the reason why is because it's learning issues of karma. How many of you feel that it's to do with karmic, working through karmic issues? Quite, quite a number do that one? All right. Well, the truth is that you don't have to work through karmic issues doing this. And in fact, yesterday we spoke to some spirits, and some of you were here, who actually were working through their issues on earth in the spirit world and they haven't come back to the earth to do that. So the truth is, the reason to return onto earth is only one reason. And that's love. There's no other reason to return to earth. Now, I will explain to many of you who are having previous life experiences <coughs> what's actually going on. And it's up to you whether you want to accept it or not. But my suggestion is to investigate it. To investigate whether what I'm saying is true to you. Does that make sense? Let yourself investigate it. Because there are lots of other potentialities other than the one you're thinking of. If you believe you have a past life and that past life was a male or, you know, or a multiple past lives, and it's highly likely that you have a number of spirits around you who are feeding you information in order to maintain a connection with you. And we'll talk about that as well. Now, the process of incarnation. Can you see what... Do you have any questions about that? So can you just that again? You've got a masculine, feminine split. The masculine part of the soul will be attracted to a male form, the feminine part of the soul, if it's predominantly masculine, it would be masculine form. Of course the soul split can be male-male too, but they are complementary halves of the one soul. Does that make sense? They can be female-female too, complementary halves. So from our father's perspective, there is no bisexuality of the soul. Do you follow me? Bisexuality is created from, and this is going to be challenging for some too perhaps, bisexuality is created from the emotional injuries that occur during your during your life here on earth. All right. And in fact, some people here are actually a gay soul and they think they're straight. All right. Because and you feel that way because of some injuries that you actually have from sexuality from your parents. Does that make sense? These things really damage us uh, completely. In fact, at the time of incarnation. Incarnation occurs a few, uh, after conception, within usually the first 10 days, incarnation of the soul occurs. When I say incarnation, there's a feeling that most people have of sort of go, jumping into the body, right? But what I'm, what I'm going to suggest is actually a connection, an energetic connection between the soul, the soul actually, the half of the soul, connects itself via an interface, and there are two interfaces that are connected. Uh, one of them is called a silver cord, I don't know if you've ever heard of that. And one is, one is a golden cord that connects. The silver cord connects the material body with the spirit form, and this, and the, this golden cord connects the, the spirit form with the soul. And and that is the way the soul experiences its world. So at the moment, you need a physical form to feel natural in a physical environment for the soul to absorb its experiences in this environment. When your physical form dies, you will be left with a spirit body form. And initially it will look similar, perhaps, to the one that you have. And I'll say perhaps because it depends on soul condition. But it may look similar to the one you currently have. 
it'll be recognisable, certainly, by you. And that is now the form by which you experience all of your sensory inputs into the soul. You can think of the spirit body and the material body as just robots used to experience a different dimension. Does that make sense? All right. Now, the incarnation process occurs at the time, usually within the first 10 days. In fact, most of you ladies who have had children, have, some of you may have felt that actually occur, where you knew you were pregnant before you had the test, not because of menstruation, but rather because you just felt something happened to you inside of yourself, like someone else was there. Right? Now, a lot of women describe that process. So that is the time when the soul incarnated. That's when your child incarnated. Now, from that moment, your child is absorbing every single emotional experience through its in interface. So while it's in your womb, <coughs> ladies, your child begins to feel everything around it. Now, if you're having an argument with your husband, the child is feeling it. If you're feeling upset inside, sad, your child absorbs that sadness. If you have an emotion within you where you're uncertain about your sexuality, your child absorbs that feeling. Does that make sense? Yeah. So, you think about it, a lot of injuries happen before you're even born. And it doesn't have to be that way, but the only way that it can't be that way is for the parents to release all of their emotional baggage so that when the child comes, they've got the best possible life that can be offered to them. And what do we call those children then? Today, a lot of those children, children are, like there's a term today called indigo children or those kind of children. Yes. Well, they are children, they are children of parents who, and, and the environment that is having less damage. I wouldn't say they have no damage because the child's children certainly have, still have damage. But they are more self-aware than other children, right? And the reason why is because they have, don't have that unworthiness damage as much as the previous generation of children. So this, this uh, birth actually only happened once ever, and it was in your first birth. It's called the virgin birth, which is kind of wrong, isn't it? Sorry. <coughs> Uh, I'm the, not sure of your question. The virgin, no, you just said uh, the, you were born what they call in you know, a virgin birth, that you did not absorb the emotions of your first parents. No, I did. You did, but yep. they were cleared. They were cleared after my birth. Okay. And one, one thing that in the first century what happened to myself is that the emotions of my parents were cleared after my birth, after the umbilical cord was cut. And now, that's the same process you will go through when you pass into the spirit world. All of the emotions that are attributable to, that are caused damage within you, that are attributable to your parents, they will be cleared from you. Right? But the emotions where you have made choices and decisions will not. And your location in the spirit world will be dependent upon the things that you are choosing to do. No, because I've talked to many spirits who have cleared their emotions while I've been talking oh, to them. Yeah, so the purpose of our being here is not to clear emotions. Right? And uh, this is a common belief I know of reincarnation. But, but it is not true. It's evolving, isn't it? Isn't it evolving? Um, no, the purpose of our incarnation is one purpose primarily, and that is individualization. Individualization. Right? That's our one purpose of being here. In other words, we now are self aware. We, at the moment of incarnation, become self-aware and we become a person who now learns how to exercise their free will. You follow me with that? 
Because, and, and so therefore, a child who is, who's conceived, so the soul incarnates shortly after conception, and then dies at three months pregnancy, has already individualized. And when they pass into the spirit world, you can actually speak with spirits who nurse them to full health. Right? This actually occurs in the spirit world. Same as a stillbirth and same as an abortion. What makes it different to, to us in here, then? Why did our what is it, individualization take why do we have to be here? <laughs> ah, there's somebody you don't want to be here. Right. <laughs> yeah. Well, the reason why um, is because usually of the choices of others. Most children die because of the choices of others, not of their own choice. And this is one thing that we need to be aware of, is that our choices collectively really severely affect other people, including our children, and in fact our children mostly. Every child who's ever been aborted, who made that decision? The parent. Is that respecting the child's free will? No. No. And every child has ever died because of a miscarriage. And this is going to be hard for some of you ladies. Has died because of what? Mother's conditions. Because of the mother's emotions. And the father's. No, it's not just the mother's father. I, I thought it was, like, what about conceiving? Um, okay, do the parents conceive the child, you know, the soul? But, uh, but it's, a lot of people have sex nowadays without a desire to have a child, do they not? That's right, but isn't it the soul's choice to incarnate? No, the soul, at its first pristine condition, has to incarnate to begin an experience. So it's still it's made the choice to have the experience. Yeah. It can't make a choice. Remember I said at that point, the soul can't make a choice. So what triggers that to incarnate? The, <coughs> the, there are a number of processes. The law of attraction and a process, a mathematical process defined by God that says that every single soul will incarnate. So it's an energetic thing. Yeah. Yeah. Like we're trying to perceive it from a mental There's a common belief today that incarnation occurs because of choice. Well, that's only the case if you're reincarnated. It's not the case for your first incarnation. Oh, okay. We're talking about first incarnation here. Mm -hmm. Always. But I haven't said anything about reincarnation. Okay, yet. but I well, there's no way that we've had our first incarnation. Otherwise, we wouldn't we, we wouldn't be able to sit here and listen to what we're talking about. Well, if this is your first incarnation, that's no, fine, isn't it? No. Why no not? way this is my first. <laughs> Ah, uh, well, all of these things can be explained, and they can explain be explained far easier than looking at reincarnation. And often, it's the simplest explanation that happens to be the truthful one. All right, and maybe I'll explain some of the reasons for reincarnation when I explain to you how reincarnation actually occurs. Is that all right? My question before we move on. Yeah. What did you say? That you said the silver cord connects the to the material body and gold cord connects the spirit cord to the soul. soul. Well, the heart of the soul, remember? Yeah. Just ask you, I don't understand it. When, well, what is the attraction of that soul to that set of parents? Um, the emotional condition of the parents, the way God has designed everything, is that the emotional condition of the parents and creates a certain type of emanation of emotions that the personality of the soul is attracted to when it incarnates. So it's to do with actually the emotions of the parents and what feelings the parents have. In the first century, I had, um, I had a daughter and, and I actually knew who would be her soulmate before she was even born. I actually chose her as my daughter. And all of you have chosen your children unbeknown to you. Right? It's like sympathetic resonance. There's there's not just sympathetic resonance, it's a, it's to do with the personality of the child 
needing a cert or, or wanting a cert, when you say wanting, it doesn't know of its desire, but the personality of the child is going to trigger certain emotions in the parents. Like, why do you attract an angry person, for example, into your life? So I can shout at them. <laughs> so you can shout at them. <laughs> well, that happens. Both. You can shout at them. Because you're angry yourself. Yeah. Not necessarily. You may be afraid of anger. And so you attract an angry person so that your fear of anger can be triggered and so you can work through it. You follow me? And it's very much the same with the personality of the souls you attract as children. They will trigger you. How many of you felt that your children never triggered you? No, they often get an angry yes to that one. <laughs> children are perfect triggers for you. And the reason why is their personality was attracted to you by your condition of your soul. And I'm not saying just the mothers, I'm saying the parents, both of them together. Does that make sense? So I'm actually saying the opposite of what people are teaching you now. You know how people say, you chose your parents? Well, I'm saying, your parents chose you. I both Well, how can you make a choice when you didn't? This is first incarnation I'm talking about. How can you make a choice when you don't know you can make a choice? You can't. Can I just take that one step further? I don't want to make this a noise and session, but just, <laughs> I just don't understand. If I was my son, would I have to say, you know, yeah. I'm going to run out of the room and just run out of the room? Or would I have to say, no, that's not what I want? Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Now, you are all going to have a big outcry at this. There's actually only two people here who have reincarnated. There's only two people here who have reincarnated. And I just said that I'm one. Yes, I told you that at the beginning. How can you tell? Um, there's a lot of ways to tell. And I'll talk about that when I get to the reincarnation bit, if I can. <laughs> Is that all right? Who's the other one? Sorry? Who's the other one? The other one can stand up if he wants to. <laughs> meet, meet, meet Cornelius. <laughs> Cornelius was the man who hammered the nails into my hands and feet in the first <laughs> century. <laughs> he looked twice the size in the first century. He was a big man. Same soul, though. same after the soul. All right. Now we've got to get to the rest of the stuff, don't we? Because it's pointless asking questions when we don't know the whole picture yet, right? So let's keep going. All right. What you have ahead of you is multi-dimensional existence. Who of you remember these multi-dimensional resistances? No? That's an indication maybe that you might not have been reincarnated. Lots of doubt coming from you. <laughs> Bit of anger. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Remember, Ed, all of these emotions are just stuff from inside of you. Does that make sense? You're allowed to have doubts, that's fine, I'm not criticizing. But they're just emotions from within you, that's all. That's okay. If any of you are feeling anger at the things I'm saying, I told you at the start it would be like this. <laughs> Did I not? <laughs> Go you said multi-dimensional existences? Yes. They are places of existence where when we pass, we live in. We actually live. There's houses, there's, cre there's beings, creations, animals, plants, everything in these locations. Better than here. Better than here. Um, some of them are worse than here. And some are better than here. And we'll talk about why. When God first created the universe, God created one dimensional existence besides the, earth, the physical dimension. And that is the place now known as the sixth sphere. This area here. And that's the sixth dimensional existence. Now, there are now sort of five before that, and then many, many after that. And what's happened is that as man has degraded in their condition of love, they created new dimensional spaces that could cope with their de degraded condition. Does that make sense? What God created was the potentiality of a dimensional existence based around the soul condition of you, your soul condition. And the first person who degraded in soul condition to the fifth sphere created the fifth sphere. Their soul entering it actually created this dimension. And the same goes to the fourth and the third and the second right down to the first. The earth in its condition is equivalent to the first sphere in condition right at the moment. It doesn't have to be, but it is. You've heard of the hells? Who believes there's a hell? That's a lot of you who are very wrong. <laughs> oh, that was challenging, eh? <laughs> uh, Hell's number one, is it? Hell's that you create if you choose There are places that are hell like hells. Yeah, it's a reality, though. It is a reality. Many people of your friends have passed into them. You have spirit friends here at the moment who you've brought along with you 
who are actually living in these places that they call hell. They're all listening, aren't they? They're all listening to, you, to us now. Yeah. Are, you, are you talking about past scriptures? I'm talking about people who have lived here on earth and lived a life in disharmony with love. Yes. And when they passed, they passed into a place of darkness that they call hell. It's not a burning, fiery torment. Mm -hmm. It's not what the Bible says, right? But it is a place that they call hell. They feel a sense of torture there. They feel terrible emotions there. Right? And many of them have come to speak with us, and some of you who have been to classes that we've had where people have come to speak know that there are a lot of people in those hells. There are lots and lots of people, in fact, in them and not knowing how to get out at the moment. If we're all new incarnations, what would these spirit makes be attracted to us as new incarnations, as new souls? Why would they be attracted to you? Yeah, why are they latching on? Oh, there's lots of reasons, um, and uh, it would take me a whole discussion of a couple of hours to explain them all. There's a, there's a book that I've written that I'd suggest you take with you that will explain five of the reasons. But the primary reason is the law of attraction occurs in the spirit world as much as it occurs here. So they are attracted to you to get something from you in most cases. Now, in some cases, it's to do to get something from you in terms of knowledge, in some cases, it's to get something from you in terms of an experience that they're now missing out on because they're in the spirit world. For example, and people who overdrink, for example, get drunk on a daily basis. Most of them have a spirit around them who is also trying to get drunk on a daily basis, using their body to do it. Does that make sense? How many of you have got drunk to the point where you're totally oblivious but still upright and managed to drive home or do something like that? How many of you have done that in the past? Right, a few. Well, a spirit did that for you. Right. The reason why is because they wanted to drink and they don't have drink in the spirit world. Does the same apply to sex? The same applies to sex, the same applies to drugs, the same applies to many experiences. Have anyone here experiencing manic depression? Manic depression is the result of spirit attachment. How many people experience schizophrenia? Schizophrenia is the result of spirit attachment. That's why in many cases schizophrenia is onsetted by drug abuse. What about depression and They can have things to do with that, um, certainly. In fact, most of mankind's illnesses have a huge amount of influence by spirits. For example, there was one child, uh, one lady I was talking to about her daughter, and her daughter was dying of leukemia, and I could feel that it was because of her grandmother who had passed, who died of cancer, influencing the granddaughter so much that the granddaughter was dying of leukemia. Once the, gr the grandmother in the spirit world realised what she was doing, because she didn't know, she stepped back from the daughter energetically, and the daughter got better. She didn't die. The grandmother was in the first fear, what, feeling a feeling of love, what she thought was love, to this grandchild. But in reality, because of the transaction, the grandmother still believed she had cancer in the spirit world, and she was influencing the creation of cancer within her grandchild. These things happen all the time. Um, well, children are very, very mediumistic. Most of you would know that probably any time you had children, they probably told you about monsters or they talk to friends sometimes and, and you say, oh, they're invisible, what are you talking to? Well, they're talking to real people, right? And most children are very mediumistic. We turn it off in them. And when they're very mediumistic, it makes it easy for a family member who's passed who has problems to influence them. Yeah, because my ex partner said as he's a young child, he had nine mm -hmm. or the spirit hearings mm -hmm. that he used to see every night when he went to bed. But his parents' experience condition and was to always deny that um, experience he was trying to share with them. That's right, yeah. Most children will know far more about the spirit world than most adults mm -hmm. for that reason, because most adults have switched it all off. Mm -hmm. yeah. 
put my water. Did I leave it? Should be a glass there. That's got water in it. The idea of the first level, um, having, people having described it as hellish, makes me feel fearful. Yes. Um, and I would like to know a little bit um, about, you know, God is this, is this loving expression. Yes. And Why is the first fear created then? Is that, yeah. That's the question, isn't it? Let, let's look at it, firstly, your own fear. You are fearful because there's a fear inside of you. And that fear needs to be experienced and released. When you release that fear, you won't feel fearful about what I'm saying. So that's first. Secondly, the locations are perfectly created by the soul condition of the person themselves. So it's actually the, the emotional conditions inside the person that created their location in the first place. Not God. Remember I said God created the sixth dimension and the other dimensions were the potentiality of them was created dependent upon mankind's condition. So as mankind's condition emotionally degraded, they created these other places. So um, you've heard of Nero. The Emperor Nero? <laughs> not that Nero. No, that's not Nero anyway, is it? And yeah. um, Emperor Nero, 2,000 years ago or so, <coughs> When he passed, he passed into the first sphere. And the reason why was because he'd created so, such evil emotions within himself that that was the only place that he'd be happy living in. Yeah. So every one of these places is perfectly suited for the people that are actually there. How do I let go of my fear? Uh, as with all emotions, you need to find its underlying cause and release that cause. You're afraid that God's going to punish you in some way and there's other sort of emotions that are within you. Yeah? And those emotions create this fear. What I'm telling you is just the truth. It's got nothing, I'm not wanting to create fear in you. In fact, quite the opposite. Remember I said fear was emotion in disharmony with love. So let go of fears. Like process them, release them. When I say process them, I mean experience them. Let yourself connect with what they are. Yeah? Hitler in the first sphere. Sorry? Is Hitler in the first sphere? Hitler is way at the bottom of the first sphere. In the, one of the darkest hells. Hitler's answer? Hitler? Hitler. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Can he be helped there? Or does... Yes. Anybody can be helped anywhere. Yes. Nero was in the, near the bottom of the, of the first sphere, and it took him 1,000 years to get out of that state, out of that condition. And he was helped by his soulmate, who he actually murdered when he was on earth. Mm -hmm. So yes, you can get out of any of these conditions. That's one of the main beautiful things to teach, right? Is that no matter how bad it is, you can get out of it. There's no such thing as eternal torment. And by the way, there's no such thing as torment by, by meaning other people doing it to you. You create through your emotional experience. So, in the 21st century now, you would be offering the sixth sphere? No, I'll talk about the spheres above in a minute. Right? Everyone understands that there's these spheres. Now, they are separated, if you look at it physically, they are separated by interstellar boundaries thousands and hundreds of thousands and millions of light years across but they are transcended by love. So every boundary is a new condition of love. Love is the separating force of these boundaries. So a person in the first sphere cannot get to the second sphere until the love that they can develop by one of two ways can help them transcend that boundary. Sense. It's love that separates each of these boundaries and the higher levels of love. What actually happens physically when you're there is as your body, your body is totally under the control of your soul, 
so this part of your soul, the half of the soul, as your soul's emotions grow in love, your, it reflects in your body. Your body's condition becomes lighter and more bright, and your soul's condition allows you to transcend the boundary because now you have a higher amount of love than what the boundary can maintain. And that's how you move from one sphere to the next sphere. I call them spheres because most of the spirits call them spheres. They are dimensional places of existence. Right. Right. Oh, I, I should say, a very important point, how do you develop your love? There's two methods. So what I'm going to do diagrammatically is separate them. Be aware there is no separation of these spheres based on these two methods. They are all available to you at any time, but these two methods are the way in which you develop your love. One is called a development in natural love. Now, natural love is the love that comes from your soul. In other words, it's the love that you have that comes from within yourself without anyone else's influence. And I'm saying to you that you can develop it. You can make it grow stronger. Now the other type of love is divine love. Now divine love does not come from your soul. Divine love comes from God's soul and can enter you but it only enters you under certain conditions it doesn't automatically enter you there's a common viewpoint on the earth today that we've all got a spark of the divine at the time we incarnate and even before and what I'm saying is that while God created you and you are an expression of God's emotions God's divine love only enters your soul when you long for it from your soul. You have to know about it first, don't you? Before well, that's you the problem, on. is that a lot of people don't know about it. And this is what I tried to teach in the first century, but it all got lost in the mud of all of these doctrines and all of the falsehoods created all of the loss of this information. It applies everywhere, including in your current existence. So, what I'm saying is that you can transcend these boundaries of love right now in your physical existence. Make sense to you? Yep. So is that your purpose? To teach people how to do that? Yes. That's, that's my life purpose, if you like. I don't want to like, tell you what to do or anything. But I'm just suggesting, try this path, because in the end, it's going to cause untold happiness for you. So let's define some of the differences between the two paths. On the natural love path, the spirits say to themselves that they are God. They get to a point of intellectually telling themselves that because God created them, and God created you, and God created me, and God created the flowers, and God created the plants, that that means we are all one, and that that means that I am also God. How many of you have had that feeling, or that thought, pass through? In, in the past, probably lots of you, right? And have contemplated that as a possibility, right? Well, when you're on the divine love path, you say, I am God's son or daughter, of course. I am God's child. Can you see the difference? One recognizes that God is an entity with whom you can communicate. The other one says, I don't need to communicate to God because I've already got. Can you see why? there would be a problem with receiving God's love if God is an entity outside of yourself with that method? What if you said, I am God and I have, I am capable of the qualities of God? 
oh, you're certainly capable of the qualities of God, but only under one condition. And that is divine love entering your soul. Without the divine love entering your soul, you will only ever be a human soul. And in fact, there are many millions and so billions of spirits in the sixth sphere who are in that state where they have yet to, they intellectually believe in God and they intellectually think they're doing all the things that God would want them to do, but they do not have an emotional relationship with God. And so you can literally go along the path to get, and it could take you to the point to opening up to receiving divine love. Yes. Because I believe that's the process of the interest. Yes, yeah, no, that's what happens, is that you can transfer, if you like, between paths at any time. Stairway to Heaven's a lovely song, right? You like Stairway to Heaven? Yes, there are two paths you can go by. But in the long run, you choose the path you're on. A lot of songs are actually channeled, right? There are, there are two paths you can go by. One of these paths is the natural love path. <clears throat> and that's the path I'm trying to talk about because to be honest with you, the majority of people on earth are on that path. Right? Now some have received divine love into their soul, but they're still trying to intellectually sort out the truth from the falsehood, right? And you cannot sort out the truth from falsehood intellectually. God's truth comes to you via emotions, so you will not be able to intellectually determine the truth. It can help you to see truth emotionally, but it's only when you actually feel the truth that you will change. For example, how many of you have given up smoking? Quite a lot, eh? How many attempts did you have to give up smoking? One. One? How many had more than one? Two, three, four, so a fair, fair majority. Right. <coughs> When you gave up smoking, it was because you had a pure desire at some point to do it. Up until then, you thought you wanted it, but there were emotions that were driving you to continue smoking, weren't there? And it was only when you started feeling the need to give up emotionally that you gave up. <coughs> and what I'm saying is it's the same with receiving divine love. You cannot intellectually do this process on this path. You can on this path. So this path is very intellectual. <clears throat> Whereas this path is very emotional. So what would be some examples of some people on earth who have been influenced by six fear spirits? Um, Almost every religious format today is influenced by six fear spirits. Because almost every religious format wants to define God their way. Do they not? So therefore, every religious format pretty much is influenced by spirits who want to define God their way too. So there's very few that connect you with God emotionally and that becomes the definition. We'll talk about some of those things later, perhaps. Let's keep going on this. What's some other things that happen? Oh, yeah. That path's very self-reliant. This path is... The only reason why most of us can't learn to trust God completely is because we have an emotion of mistrust within ourselves. Uh, that's called God reliant, sorry. And that's self reliant. Sorry? Um, self-reliant is um, based on distrust and God-reliant based on trust. Self-reliant is based on I only trust myself. Yeah. God-reliance is based on I, I trust myself and I also trust this being, this relationship that I have with this being that's outside of myself. You can see you're going to have to work through all your trust issues to have a relationship with God. Mm -hmm. 
No. Yeah. How many of you got trust issues? How many of you don't trust anything I'm saying? <laughs> I don't blame you. But if you don't, it's because there will be a feeling of self-reliance in you. Where you have a fear of what I'm saying. What's he trying to do? Does he want me to follow him? Does he want me to pay him money? You, you know, all those different things, right? That's what comes up inside of us sometimes because we don't trust. We don't trust. The beauty of the law of attraction is you're here because you, your soul wanted you here. The law of attraction operated for us to meet. Didn't it? So if that's the case, then you're here for a good purpose. And that is your soul to grow. Even if it's a negative experience and I'm a charlatan, it's going to help us all grow. Can you see the difference between the two paths? There's many more of things I could mention. Now, the natural love path will enable you to grow in your love of inside that comes from inside of you. But you will only be able to grow it until the sixth fear of love. In other words, once you become perfect, in the way you display the love that comes from inside of you, you will be in the sixth sphere, whether you're here on earth or you're a spirit, doesn't matter, you will be in the sixth sphere in terms of your condition. Is there anyone who's got there while on earth? Uh, there's no one on earth currently, oh sorry, there's no one on earth currently just in the sixth sphere condition. Has there ever been? Um, yeah, in the first century I was in a greater condition than the sixth sphere. Anyone else? Uh, no. <clears throat> Not on earth. There's millions of spirits in that condition. Billions of spirits. Is so if we've got no one, like, how do we find all this out? Like, there's no one there that's got this love. How are we going to teach it to someone? God wants to teach you directly. In other words, God wants a personal communication link from you to Him. And He wants to teach you all truth. Now, what you need to know is how to make that link happen. Yep. And that, that's the problem that most people on earth face today is they don't know how to make the link happen. But once that link occurs, you will learn the truth directly from God. You won't need anyone else to tell you. Are you saying once all the emotion is gone, you think about the only reason why you do not establish a relationship with God right now is because there's emotions within you that prevent the establishment of that relationship. So, of course, it's going to result in you needing to release some emotions that, that you're basically, many of you at the moment are saying, some, you know, some of you have received some of divine love, yes, you know you have. So, but many are saying, no, no, I don't want to go any further because this is starting to get a bit scary for me. Or, no, no, I don't want to go any further because I have to live in truth if I go further and I don't want to live in truth. For example, let's say you are in a, in living in an abusive relationship. Do you think God wants you to live in an abusive relationship? He's living in an abusive relationship in harmony with love of yourself. No. Now, now, if you're going to receive more divine love, you're going to have to get out of your abusive relationship. But there's many reasons why a person won't. Financial, fear of fa family or friends, criticisms and so forth, right? They're all emotions they're going to have to firstly release and deal with before they'll leave that partnership and before they can connect with more of love from God. Do you see how it works? We often block the flow of love from God because we don't want to change here. We don't want to change our lives because we're afraid here. And the key is to get over that and start processing those emotions of fear and release them. Then we will grow. So it's our fear-based mind filters that are blocking our progress. And a lot of fear comes from your soul, remember, but it's an error. See, this is why fear is so debilitating sometimes, because it does come from an emotional state. You think about all the times you've been terrified in your life. It feels like an emotion, doesn't it? And you just run, don't you? Like, how many of you have been so terrified that you're just sort of like a, a dog that 
wet itself sort of thing. <laughs> and just it's frozen in fear. I've had that state myself where I'm just frozen in fear. We often are frozen in fear in our lives. Yeah. And that prevents this connection. Remember, fear is in disharmony with love. And um, you find it out through the law of attraction. The world is bringing to you exactly what your soul condition currently is. So if right at the moment you're experiencing negative, what you feel are negative events, then it's because your soul condition, your emotions have attracted them. Right? So that tells you the truth. Yeah, but supposing that's not the case. If you're quite happy with the way things are, then you seem to be attracting them. All right, there's another thing that's going on. Do you feel God's divine love flowing through you every hour of every day? You know, constantly. Well, I don't know what, what to expect that to feel like. Well, well, I can tell you, you know what it feels like when you feel it. So if you're not feeling it, there's a reason for it not happening. That makes sense, doesn't it? God would give it to you if God could give it to you. But if you're preventing it here at the emotional level, then it won't flow. Yeah. God doesn't withhold things. It's us that prevent things. Yeah. So we can tell ourselves that we're happy, and that's fine. There are six fear spirits in the six fear who are beautiful. They, they classify themselves as beautifully happy. We're actually going to talk to a six fear spirit this afternoon who, who is now in this divine love path above the eight sphere. And she will talk to you about how her feelings were in the six fear. And she was very detuned from her emotions at that stage. She believed she had none emotions, no emotions to work through. She believed that. Is that because they were so numb down, she didn't think? Suppressed, yeah. We can suppress our emotions to such an extent that we believe we don't have them anymore. In fact, it's one of the major ways that we suppress our emotions, is to tell ourselves that we don't have them anymore. <laughs> I had that exact experience. I didn't believe I had any of those emotions, especially fear and, and all those. And, and I listened to you for two months, and it was all intellectual. Yeah. The law of attraction started pushing buttons, and I felt it. Yeah. And w so, what are you feeling now, Dennis? Well, uh, it's, well, I just you feel the emotions emotion. flowing yeah. now. That's it. We just move on. Yeah. Yeah. Just still scared and move on. Yeah. But there, no, there's things coming up that you thought you didn't have. That's it, yeah. 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 We, we can t you're, you can exercise your mind very powerfully. Your mind is a powerful tool, but it's only a tool. If you let the mind dominate you, you are going to find this path the easiest. If you start letting the soul dominate you, the emotions dominate you, you will get, find this path easier. The key is you can make the choice whenever you want. I'm not decrying this path. It still results in progression. It still results in you at some point being perfected in the way you display your love. But you'll never get above the sixth fear in the, in the spirit world when you pass if you do not follow this other path. But the first intellectual path can lead you to opening up to the soul. Yes, totally, totally. These paths are not separate in nature. You can, you can find one or the other any time. The problem is that the many stay on the way they've progressed before. So many of you will feel like, well, you know, what AJ is saying to me seems pretty outlandish. For goodness sake, the man thinks it's Jesus, you know, and then he's going to tell me these things. You know, I can't trust that, right? And so you will stay on the way you've been progressing, and that's okay. But I'm telling you, there is this other way. And it is available to you. And many who have listened to me for some time have started to experience it and have started to understand that way. So I was just going to say that when I first met you, I was firmly planted on the natural love path for about 20 years. Yeah. And whatever you said made sense, so I wanted to try it out. Yeah. And the moment I set my intention on you know, the divine love path, everything worked much faster. Yeah. More painful, but much faster. Yes. Yeah. Much, much faster. Here we sort of numb ourselves to pain. 
Here we allow our pain to exist and be experienced. Do you want to know what's above? <laughs> There's the seven sphere, and the seven sphere is a unique place. And it's also a very unique place when you experience it on Earth as well. Because in the seventh sphere, you no, you no longer use your mind anymore. Everything comes from your emotions. Everything comes from your feelings. And you're learning to not think and worry and stress and all those other things anymore. But you are fully involved in everything around you emotionally. So you are not detuning. Not, it's not like the Buddhists would say to you about reaching nirvana is a process of, what did they normally suggest? Any of you tried those experiences? Detachment. They normally suggest detachment. It's not a process of detachment. What I'm saying on the divine love path, you will become attached to everything. What do you think mean, being at one with everything means? Doesn't it mean being attached to everything? But you will not have any feelings that are disharmonious with love in that process. And that's what you're learning in the seventh sphere. And then, above the seventh sphere, and the first transition into the eighth, you become... Oh, here we go. Another hard thing. I'm going to tell you some things about the Bible because... No, these things I mentioned in the first century, right? Some of them are written in the Bible. And this is one of them. In the first century, I had a discussion with a man called Nicodemus. And Nicodemus was a religious leader at the time. And I talked to him about the soul's transition from the seventh sphere into the eighth sphere. And I, and I talked to him about it's like being born again. It's being born from a human soul into a divine soul or an angel. You've heard the term angels. Angels exist above the seventh sphere. And every one of you can become an angel. Right? And it can happen here on earth. It can happen here on earth, yes. You can do it while you're alive here on earth. You'll see that happen in the future on earth. Part of the big world transitions that are happening through this 2012 thing is all about this. Most people on earth are not aware, but it is all about what's going to happen in terms of people, groups of people like yourselves making the tr final transition into, it's not a final destination, but it's a transition into the state of being born again while they're alive here on earth. Sorry? Born again? No, no, I don't mean born again. I'm not referring, I'm referring to the soul, not the body, for a start. The soul tr is transformed into a new type of soul. Because it, so much of divine love has entered that soul that it transforms the soul into a new type of soul. A soul that now is conscious of its own immortality. A soul that is able to do very many powerful things that are not available to it before then. And it's a soul that's also now at one with God. So what happened with Nicodemus? And he, he didn't understand what I was talking about. He, he understands now. He's in the celestial spheres. But in the first century he didn't understand what I was talking about. And what happened? Um, he was a Pharisee, so he was involved, in fact, with the decisions about my execution. And, uh, and then he passed into the spirit world and slowly he found the divine path because he was always interested in, in talking to me. And he made that transition. So he is now up there, that one with God. Is this what the so-called modern spiritual world talks of this thing, liberation? In? Liberation. Liberation. And I would say that when you're at the state of net perfected natural love, you are liberated from sin, or you're liberated from disharmony with natural love. 
at that point you feel free. In other words, you feel like your free will is able to be exercised completely. However, because you haven't received divine love, you're not truly liberated. So there's a lot of terminology that's used today, and most of it comes from spirits in the sixth sphere trying to understand the divine love path intellectually. In other words, you've heard of the term at one with God, right? Pretty much everyone would have heard of that. Yeah? And most people, I've talked to many people who are on this path who think they're at one with God. But it's not a thought. Being at one with God is not a thought, it's a condition. So, the thing to realize is that almost everything that's told to you today is told through emotional filters between spirits and here on earth. And on top of that, the majority of things are taught through wanting to intellectually understand something that will never be intellectually understood. Maybe I can give you an example. Can you tell me what love is intellectually? You might spend, what, a week telling me all about love, right? But if I never experience it, will I understand? So what do I need to do? Experience it. Feel it. Feel it. And this is what I'm saying to you. Many of the spirits in the natural love path, people in the natural love path, have not experienced anything that they're talking about. They have come to believe it intellectually, but they are not experiencing it emotionally. When you experience it emotionally, you will find this path. So, so if you go through the intellectual path and then actually evolve or whatever, transition into the um, path. divine love yep. path, then do you have integration of mind and, you know, it's the integration of the intellectual and the experience? No. Does it come together? Or? The mind is a tool just like your arm is a tool. So what happens is instead of becoming mind dominant, see at the moment many of us are mind dominant, right? What that means is this tool that should be just used as a tool from our soul, from our heart, has become so dominant that it dominates our heart. It tells us what to do. And it's the wrong way around. But what you will learn on this path is to become opposite. The opposite of that, which is heart dominant, emotion dominant. The, spirit, the spirits who are perfected in natural love are mind dominant. The spirits who are perfected in divine love, which happens in the eighth sphere, are heart dominant. They're passion dominant. They desire. They haven't suppressed their desires. They have all of their desires. But their desires are harmonious with love. Does that make sense? Is intuition heart dominant? Yes, intuition soul. certainly is a is soul based okay. a soul based feeling. Yep. Certainly. Yeah. Right, now above the eighth sphere, and I'm running out of board space. And I'm not gonna rub out God here, but this needs to be a bit fixed, okay? lots of spheres, lots of dimensions above there. In fact, I'll draw a line across here at the 21st and the transition between the 21st and the 22nd sphere. So after you become at one with God, you continue learning about God. Why? Because God is infinite. Right? This transition is an interesting transition because here you've got one half of the soul with this spirit form, the other half of the soul with its spirit form, and above there, the two halves of the soul combine, recombine into the one soul. Now it's only a soul that has got to that stage that can reincarnate. Because at the point of reincarnation, two bodies are created, and if you have a spirit form, you cannot 
you cannot perform the process of reincarnation. It's really quite simple. It's one of the laws of our, our God. <clears throat> the soul can only reincarnate or incarnate at any time when it is combined, when it begins in a combined state. It cannot reincarnate in a non-combined state. Does that make sense to everyone? I know it's, it might be out there, right? But that's what actually happens. You, the two halves of the soul recombine, and in that state, they are now completely individualized as a complete unit. So up until that state, they're growing towards each other as well as towards God. Once they get to that state, they have now combined as each other. They have now become one in a, in a real sense. What does it feel like? Um, what it feels like is that every single experience that person has ever had becomes your experience. And every single experience you've ever had becomes theirs. And you become one person in everything you do. You now don't think of yourself at all as being a separate person to your soulmate. I know it may be hard to conceptualise. Um, when you're talking about the two parts coming together, are you talking about the one who, was it, who became a female person and the one who became a male person? Yes. And they've got to arrive up there. Simultaneously or Sorry? Do they have to arrive up there simultaneously? Uh, they do have to make that transition simultaneously, but they don't have to arrive to that point yeah, simultaneously. Yeah. So one's got one half's going to get there and hover and wait for the other. And wait for, and help the other to get there too. Usually that's what happens. And at that time the spirit bodies are not needed anymore. The spirit bodies aren't required anymore to experience because the one soul doesn't need any bodies to experience anything. That's what made most sense to me that you can't actually, I mean, besides the reunification of the soul halves, also uh, you can't reincarnate before because you're still in the spirit body. That's right. That cannot the, re the spirit body can't push away another spirit body. Right? So you can't incarnate with a spirit body. And I can guarantee to you, every spirit who's above the sixth fear and in the sixth fear knows this. So we can talk to them. Yes, thanks. What happens if you meet your soulmate on Earth? And most of you will meet your soulmate on Earth. Will you know? No, probably not. The reason why is it depends on whether you've dealt with all of your emotional injuries or not, as to whether you will be attracted. Does that make sense to you? You think about it. If I'm an angry man and my soulmate doesn't like angry men, then are we going to be attracted? If my soulmate doesn't like angry men, and I'm an angry man, she may even know who I am, right? She may know I'm her soulmate, but she's not going to be attracted to me while I'm angry, is she? I'm going to have to release the anger and get to the state where I'm no longer angry before there'll be an attraction. So have you, have you got to deal with every emotional luggage? When you get to the 8th sphere, you will have dealt with every single bit of emotional baggage in your entire existence. How do you do that? It's really simple, actually. What about oh, people? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, everyone doesn't believe me. <laughs> um, so if you get the emotions, if you, if, you, if you embrace your emotional baggage at a much faster rate than complimentary any sphere or... Yes. So you've progressed faster than you. And a lot of times if you meet them, you'll try to assist them. Like, you, like I, have met, I have met my soulmate. She has no idea who I am. And, and I, she, she can't remember who I am because she's refusing all of her emotions at the moment. So, or a lot of her emotions, I should say. And, and so she, is, she needs some assistance. And I'm trying to give her what assistance I can along with her free will, so it's depending on yeah. whether she wants yeah. to. Does that make sense? Yeah. And does that cause you a lot of pain? And being without my soulmate in the past caused me a lot of pain, certainly. 
But I had to, one of the ways of me progressing was I had to release all of that pain. So it, that took nearly seven years of crying for me to release my pain about my soul mate. No, no, it's the same soulmate. Same soulmate. Yep, so same soulmate. Once you've got them, that's it. That's it. Well, that's the <laughs> way. <laughs> that's I, I reckon there's an emotional injury there. <laughs> God created you as one to bleep whole. And you split in half. And it's the same halves that recombine, split, recombine, split. You can persevere as much as you wish. I must be thanks. Um, I'm still having trouble with how do I identify those emotional things which you say I must have, and what is it that's so easy, the way you say it is, to find it in the problem. And I have a whole session where we talk about those things. And because I'm still working on this summary, if you like, and we also have some channeling to do afterwards, it's not going to be possible for me to describe that entire process at the moment. It's really simple though because there's only three things involved. But when I say simple, the word simple and easy are two different words, right? It's simple to understand but not easy to do, particularly when we're coming from our mind. Right? But it, the process is simple to understand. It's three things only. The first thing is long to God for her love to enter your soul. Have, start developing a love affair with God. That's what I'm suggesting. Start to come to know God through this emotional transaction. That's number one. Number two. Be prepared to experience every single emotion that arises because of this affair with God. And I can tell you that every single emotion that's in you, that's in disharmony with God, will be identified in that relationship. Third, and you need to be willing, of course, to release them, right? Is it obvious? To experience them. And many times it's not as obvious as you may think. And, and maybe... Um, when I get Natalie up, you can ask her about some of her experience and she can tell you about some of her experiences as well. It's not always obvious. It's only obvious when you're prepared to feel everything. And of course, at the start, we're usually not prepared to feel anything. So that's what makes it difficult. Right? Most of the time we have tried to deny ourselves emotionally. It began when we were little, right? Didn't it? Didn't it? How many of you were told, big girls, boys, don't cry? Well, not pretty much everyone. How many of you were told, if you cry again, I'll belt you? No. I'll give you something to cry about. I say that to my son today. Okay. okay. What we're doing is we're shutting down emotion. And when we shut down emotion, we are tuning the person out of their soul. Yeah. And that's happened to all of us at some point, hasn't it? You think about our life. Hey Jay, could you just you give the example of the analogy you use when someone cuts you up in the car to explain the Certainly. And but before I do that I'd like to say the third thing. Can I do that? The third thing was that you need to be prepared to investigate emotionally investigate God. How do you ever get to know somebody if you're not prepared to learn about them? And what? And do you ask everybody else about them? Like, like I want to know, get to know Peter, so I ask, you know, I go over here and I ask people about, what do you think about Peter? What do you think about Peter? I'm going to get a hundred different answers, aren't I? Some of them will like Peter, some of them won't, some of them will like this particular thing, but not like that. How do I really get to know Peter? to enter a relationship with people. And that's how you get to know God too. You need to enter a relationship with God, which means learning about God from people who already know about God. Right? Not people who think they know about God, but who feel God. So it's 
not an intellectual definition of God. It's no. an experience of it's God telling you about mm. herself. And yeah. I know she always uses the feminine expression of herself, not himself. Well, I use either. It doesn't God has masculine and feminine qualities? I use the term father and mother. No, I just use yeah. How can we tell the difference between those people who are just intellectualizing them? They will say things like this. The people who know God will say things like this. Now, I've got a heap of uh, CDs, by the way. On the CDs, I've divided the CDs into natural love and divine love paths, right? So they are data CDs, so you can look at them on the computer. There's literally tens of thousands of pages of channeled material. Some about uh, 5,000 pages of 5,000 channeled material, uh, channels from different spirits are from spirits on this path. And there's some that are also from spirits of this path and you can read them. There's a whole group of messages called the pageant messages that are on there. There's about uh, close to 2,000 pages of material. If you want to read it, it's all channel material. It's channel material that myself and a group of spirits who were in the spirit world channeled to pageant in the 1900s, in the early 1900s. And they contain much of the truths that I'm talking to you about. You will find there will be some discrepancies because truth grows and new truth always comes along. But they are the truths that were there at 19, in the 1900s. Does that make sense? That's what the spirits knew at that time. There's also a printout on qualities of truth and, and reincarnation and divine love. So this process of reincarnation and what actually happens during this process, I've described to a number of people through a series of letters that I had with them, and those letters are in this printout as well. You're free to take those with you as well. They're all free. Right. Yeah. Is it possible to experience and feel that occurrence in the physical? Yes. It's possible to go through the soul union process in the physical. And one of the things that is my intention is to show that to you at some stage in the future. Right. So can you tell us about the spheres above the eighth? Uh, between the eighth and the twenty-first spheres you're just learning more and more and more about God, really. And more and more and more about divine love. You're learning constantly. There's an infinite number of things to learn. In this area, it's called the Celestial Kingdom. In the first century, I called it the Kingdom of God. So whenever you see in the Bible the term Kingdom of God, it's that area that I was referring to. You can't enter the Kingdom of God until you're born again. I actually said that in the first century, right? You can't do that. <coughs> to enter the Kingdom of God, you need to be through this process of being born again. Right? Now, lots of spirits don't believe this process is possible. And those spirits usually follow the natural love path until such time as they start to allow themselves to feel. And what we're going to do after a break is we're going to talk to one of those spirits who was in the sixth sphere, but who transferred onto the divine love path and we'll talk to her about how long that took and all those kind of things and her experiences in that transition and into the transition of a one with we've got. And you can ask questions. I've not talked to her before, so I don't know what she's going to say. Her name is Lucinda. She's come to us because she wants to be a part of it. So there's the born again, the songs, what we refer to as the songs during the journey, you know, as a popular term. Yeah, when, when we say soul's journey... Is the transition? Um, yeah, don't, don't think though that it's predestined. This is totally based on your choice. So, you know, a lot of times on the natural love path we hear terms like you will follow your higher self and all those kind of things. Well, what I'm saying is your higher self, forget about higher self, lower self, all that. It's just self. Right? Your self, it, 
is your soul. Not your physical body, not your spirit body, but your soul. And your soul has emotions, passions, desires, longings, and so forth, and it's that that you're developing and connecting to. Often on earth we don't connect to it because we live here, rather than here. Right. Is there any questions about that whole process now? Now that's as far as I've been, so I can't tell you anything more. Than as a summary, I mean. There's a lot I can tell you in between. But as a summary of the whole process, that's what you can choose to do if you wish. It's a choice you have. Now, many have asked questions about reincarnation and why is it... Oh, I must tell you. Reincarnation began in 1963. That was the first time that anyone on this earth reincarnated. There are other earths, by the way, and people have reincarnated onto those ones, but on this earth, the first time that anyone reincarnated was 1962. When I say lots of other earths, there are other locations in this physical universe where people go through the same process you're going through, the, re the incarnation of the soul. So they're just like us? Yes. They don't have green heads in them. <laughs> <laughs> Why 62? What's their, what, why did they... There's no significance in it, but that's just when the first person did it. It's your birth date. Uh, no. Your date of conception. Yes. Yes, lots of significance. Yes, there, there are the initial group of people who reincarnated were fourteen. There were fourteen who originally reincarnated. I'm one of them. My soulmate is another one. So each there were seven soul pairs, fourteen people. So, do you want me to name them? Okay. There's myself and Mary Magdalene. We are one soul together. Then there's um, the Apostle John and his soulmate. His soulmate's male, by the way. The Apostle John. In the first century, you may have heard some of these people. You just contradicted yourself because mm -hmm. you just said before about the soulmate, right? She's not really here. She's still got some emotions and she has to sort them. Yeah. And, and remember, I said without. She wouldn't have been reincarnated as to what you just told us. Ah, uh, but you'd have to understand the process of reincarnation to know what went on. And I haven't explained that yet. And I've written it all in there. So, And I won't have time to explain it now, but I've written it all in there. The truth is that what happens is, at every reincarnation you absorb the emotions of your parents. And at every reincarnation you have to then work through those emotions. You need to choose to do that. If you refuse to do that, then you won't ever remember. So what I'm saying to you is every one of you will know whether you've been reincarnated or not if you work through your emotions. Can I go again? <laughs> How do I work through my emotions? <laughs> And they are your father's emotions impressed upon you. So they've become yours, but yes, your father first had them. Now there's some deep water. <laughs> Very deep water, as you know. And you can feel even that emotion towards your father now, right? Yes. Yeah. And you know there's a fair bit to work through there. What if you were adopted and you didn't know? And Natalie behind you was adopted. And she's had to work through the issues of two fathers that she didn't have. <laughs> There's lots of different issues that come up through different emotional states, right? Yeah. J just because you've been adopted doesn't mean you don't have an issue with the masculine. I know I wasn't adopted, which is fine. No, I'm not talking about you either. I'm just saying just because a person's adopted and they might have been adopted by a woman and there was no male in the house, it doesn't mean that she won't have issues with the masculine. She will have whatever emotional issues her mother has with the masculine.
Certainly, because you think about it, most of our injuries, there's a whole group of injuries that come from environment, right? But the majority of our very, very deep-seated injuries come from mum and dad, our relationship with our parents or our siblings, generally. So... Sorry, you're working with the seventh day of the song. Uh, oh yeah, that's right, the names of the song. Sorry about that. Someone asked, uh, where was up to? John, the Apostle John. Apostle John and his soulmate, Nathaniel. Um, John the Baptist, uh, sorry, and his soulmate. Who, who, you've heard of John the Baptist? Yes. From the Bible? Yeah, he's, a, he's another. He, oh, by the way, the Apostle John and his soulmate incarnated into Australia. John the Baptist and his soulmate incarnated into South Africa. Right? There's Luke and his soulmate, Sarah, who is my daughter from the first century. Right? They incarnated into Canada. There's a, a, a lady called Elisa and her soulmate, who is female, and they both incarnated into Vietnam. There's uh, a soul couple, John Mark and his soulmate, Tabitha, and they incarnated into South America. There's... Uh, who have I missed? Cornelius, of course, and his soulmate, and they incarnated into Australia. Now that's seven, I think. What was the purpose? And the purpose is to firstly reteach these truths to man. Second purpose is to, there are lots of smaller purposes obviously in that, some of which are to help man through the coming transitions and so forth. Right? But the biggest purpose is to help you connect with God. To help you have the relationship that we have with God, to help you have exactly the same relationship with God. Now, the reason why we chose to reincarnate rather than materialise, because we could have materialised, is because we wanted to experience life in the 20th century, getting to the point of one with God with a lot of errors from the 20th century, so that we could actually connect with you and help you do the same. Does that make sense? By demonstration. By demonstration of our own lives. So today, all of you um, we reincarnated into certain locations for lots of different reasons. There were, there were reasons of self-protection of the soul. In other words, what's the point of reincarnating if, if a few months later we died and passed again? There's not much point in that process. So we wanted to make sure that we lived to an age where... And, and only one of the 14 have passed at this point. So the um, majority of us have survived. And what are, what are the implications in, in terms of 2012 and the earth changes? Firstly, people moving onto the divine path, and secondly, your role. And I, I can't, what I'm trying to do, I can't change anything inside of you, right? In fact, I don't want to. What I want to do is assist you to develop a desire to change yourself. I don't want to force you into doing anything. But if you choose to grow on the divine love path, the changes that occur to your soul will be so great that the earth will feel them. Just one person in the first century, in the condition I was in, caused so much change to the world. You imagine all of you being in that same condition. And how much change there would be to the world. How, huge how much progress has happened since you've been teaching? And quite a lot have gone onto the path. Some are in the third sphere. There's, uh, there's one, or, one or so persons in the seventh sphere. There's a few in the sixth and the fifth. And there's quite a lot now in the third sphere, right, in terms of their progression on the divine love path. And as everyone shifts, right at this moment listening to me, you are shifting. And I can feel the shifts that are happening within you, right? And just the shifts that you make from today will cause a change to what will happen events-wise on the earth. What is going to happen? Well, the problem is saying what is going to happen. Or what might happen. What might happen. What's the point in talking about what might happen? Like, it's like, um, I could say what would happen today. But the problem is that for some of you, some of you have fear and that would just scare you and then other ones of you will have certain other emotions. And in the end, what I'm saying is going to happen today won't happen because some of you will move and progress 
and so tomorrow this, the, the same attractions are not going to occur, so it's not going to happen. So can you see what the conundrum is? This is why, you know, there's been a lot of spirits predicting earth change events, right? You know of uh, ones right, right from olden times even, um, the 1800s and even right in the Bible, earth change events were predicted a long, long time in advance. Now, the problem with every prediction is that they are based on the current soul condition of man. And the problem is they come a lot of times from a natural love spirit who doesn't know what the soul condition of man really is. Day by day, yeah. So let's say, let's say I began talking about earth change events and all of you became fearful as a result. Then that would actually lower the, your vibration, if you want to call it that. It lowers your harmony with love. And as a result, the earth change would be more negative, would be more powerfully felt by man in a negative way. Just these transitions as they do. Self-fulfilling prophecy. Self-fulfilling prophecy. So I don't want to go around scaring everyone about earth change events. What I want to do is focus you on the real thing, which is your soul. That's the real you. Focus on that. Focus on developing that. Make choices based on that. Feel your way through these world changes that are going to come. And often at the beginning it is difficult to know. Um, but as you process through different aspects of love, you can actually feel the divine love inside of yourself. You can feel God's love motivating your decisions. What does it feel like? Um, well, what, if I just answer that question a bit more first, is... Let's see, that love your neighbour as yourself, that's when I felt. I just knew that was wrong. I just felt there was no love in this yeah, that's natural love, by the way. Yeah. That's the love coming from yourself. Love your neighbour as yourself is not what I'm talking about. What I'm talking about is receiving God's love into your soul and you will begin to reflect like God reflects. So it will naturally shine out of you, won't it? Yeah, well, how do you... Like, I know a lot of you think I'm crazy, right? But how are, other than that, how do you feel about me? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. I felt calm. And you can feel it too from from your heart. Because I love I love you, right? And I can feel that love, right? It's a gentle radiance. Thank you. And you will have exactly that too. Right? And what will happen is everyone around you will notice it too. And you will change. Your life will change. And sure, some of the things you will think, oh, I'm cursing AJ because I wish I'd never gone on this path. <laughs> Natalie tells me that, uh, that I should have come with a warning sign. <laughs> and the divine love path should also come with a warning sign. She doesn't feel that every day, but some days the emotions are a bit rough, right? Because every single emotion that is inside of you that's disharmonious with being at one with God is going to come out if you choose this path. Maybe what you need to do is concentrate on the message, not the messenger. Yeah, and that's what I would prefer you do. <coughs> Sorry? It doesn't work on the message, it's just so much, I don't know, love and feeling for you that we do what we do, that I can't always just... Concentrate on the message. Yeah, I'll do that too. So I distract you from my own message. No. <laughs> 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 just completely disconnect from the messenger is not possible. Uh, not always. So Ob obviously, if a person is very angry and they're telling you about love, are you going to connect with that? <laughs> obviously not, right? <laughs> obviously, for it to be real in terms of a feeling for yourself, you've got to see it reflected in a person who's teaching you these things. And, and that is something that you will need to decide yourself. And one of the things I wish to be is an example for others to see, well, this is real. It's, it's not a figment of my imagination. Uh, this divine love, this connection with God is not a figment of my imagination. It's real. 
And I know that if you go through these emotions and you connect with God and you face the truth within yourself, you will feel it's real. You will. It will affect you here and you'll know it's real. So all our personal development courses that we do and all that kind of thing, uh, we're using our mind as a tool to decompress the emotional body, heal the emotional body and let go of the uh, emotional attachment to the filters of our mind mm. so that we can actually open up to having a connection with the body. In the end, it's not harmful if it's helping you connect emotionally. Yeah. The, the thing that becomes harmful is when your mind dominates. Yeah. That is a very harmful state. And all of us in a state of doubt are at a state of mind dominance. And what we're trying to do is work our way through these emotions to get to, get back to, here. to, get back to here, right? So anything you can do, and this is why I won't decry any religious thing you choose to do, any development thing you choose to do, any self-development you choose to do, any relationship you want to have, anything that you want, do if it's going to lead you through your emotions. Fear is very much connected with the mind, right? So, so certainly, one of the things you are all going to need to deal with at some point is your fears. How many of you feel afraid about different things? Like, how many of you feel afraid to go and talk to your own mother sometimes? Like, <laughs> right? Or your own father? Don't know about that one. And how many of you would be afraid if an ex-partner came and knocked on your door and said, "I want to have a chat." <laughs> right? All of these things are just telling you things you've not yet resolved, right? Just things not yet resolved. You will need to resolve them if you wish to be one with God. When I say resolve them, I don't mean intellectually dominate them. I mean feel them and release them from you. It's an emotional process. Well, um, I think... Everyone needs a break, don't they? Yeah. Yeah. So what we do is we have a break, and when you come back, you will be given an opportunity to communicate with Natalie and also communicate with some spirits, uh, in particular probably one spirit, who wants to tell you about her experience in the natural love path and when she actually moved over to the divine love path.